Good afternoon and thank you for having me here. This, my name is Rhys Newman and this is Chris Dennis. We've just come in from Oxford and uh, we'd like to talk to you about Nereus, a global infrastructure for massively parallel computing, something we've been working on for a while. And there are two parts to this technology. Nereus is the main subject of the talk today. And we'll also talk a little bit about, about JPC, which is an emulator that fits into this uh, technology in, in a way that the slides will explain. Chris, next slide. This is a simple equation I want to propose. Uh, we have loads and loads of idle machines over in the left-hand side there. Then we put JPC in together, so add a cross-platform standardized PC emulator, uh, add some distributed management software, and hey presto, we get a global infrastructure for computation. Go to the next one. Of course, these machines have been around for a long time, and they're uh, they've been around, there are a billion PCs in the world. What's the problem with using them currently? We've known they've been idle for a while, and the problems really are twofold, I believe. There's distribution of the data, how to get the data there, the processing there, and the software, software there to process, uh, and then there's the security issues coming back. So you've got to make sure that when you send your data to a remote server or remote client, uh, that that data is not left there and you're not worried about privacy. Uh, but equally, and probably more importantly, there's the issue of the owners of those machines being persuaded that your software is safe to run. And clearly with the many malware trojans and other things in the, in the world right now, that's a very difficult uh, argument to make to people unless they know you personally. Okay, the next slide. So there's a sort of approach you could take to try and make software uh, secure for the purposes of running on third-party resources. You could use some sort of um, sandbox or virtualization to try and put, it, uh, put the software in a virtual machine and therefore contain it uh, and make the user feel happier about the fact that it's contained. However, virtualization technology is on the whole too close to the hardware and it suffers from various issues like support issues, various combinations of hardware support and, and software problems. Plus, in the case of certain hypervisors, they need to be quite close to the bare metal and updates being possibly difficult to apply, especially if you're not a system administrator. Equally, um, which one of those solutions would you use if I said to you that you were going to expose your machine to anyone in the world, you're going to advertise the fact that you were offering your machine for execution to anyone in the world and you essentially knew that the world's hackers were going to try and hack your machine? which container of those three, or indeed others, would you trust? Well, I contend you probably wouldn't trust any of them by themselves. Um, so one solution is to use an emulator to try and get away from the hardware a bit so that you have a simple upgrade path. You just, it's just a user process. You don't need to worry about administrator rights and so on. Um, and you, you move away from that and you become a little bit more secure because it's emulation, not closely linked to the hardware. Next one. So here are the layers that I'm proposing, a two-layer step. Firstly, emulators are products, so even the emulators will have bugs in them, so you can't rely on them alone either. So why don't we start with the most widely available and trusted virtual machine, the Java virtual machine, which was built to run third-party code, and that's what applets essentially are. And then we built an emulator for x86 execution in pure Java, so not getting around and outside the applet sandbox or the Java sandbox provided by the JVM, we stay within it. And if you put those two together, we have a possibility of running unvetted software inside this emulated hardware with two independent layers of security between the potentially hostile uh, guest software and your real data in real machine. So this is what JPC does, it's an, it's an emulator. So Chris, you click the next one. There's the stack, we build it up. We have the hardware and then the normal applications, but then we put the Java virtual machine in and we have virtual hardware, another operating system and applications inside there and the applications running inside there are emulated. They don't know about the, the fact they're on an emulated system, and the emulated system is isolated completely from the software inside the, uh, the emulator. So if we click the next bit, we can change the bottom stack there very easily, go to a different operating system. The Java virtual machine allows us to avoid uh, worrying about the platform specifics, and even different hardware. We can then absorb the idle time of set-top boxes, potentially, all the while maintaining the illusion for the guest software that it's running on an x86 PC. So from the point of view of using all these resources, you don't have to keep recompiling code for different targets. 
you just run to this, your favourite x86 and run it like that. And one final, perhaps uh, frivolous use, is the possibility of running on a mobile phone. And I can show you JPC running on that if anyone's interested later on. So now we're going to do a demo of JPC. We're just going to flip the slides away and then we're going to boot up JPC. So this is running inside a Java virtual machine. There we go. So this is booting DOS. And this is unmodified original DOS. So uh, we haven't changed it at all. We downloaded it from the free DOS page. Um, and this thinks it's got an A drive and it thinks it's got a C drive. And it's got some games there. Chris is going to try and run one of them. Lemmings, OK. So let's go and see what Lemmings has for us. Now the, the, the bar at the bottom of the screen there, the one that's going backwards and forwards, is an estimate of the virtual clock speed that JPC is achieving. And you can see that's actually quite slow at the moment. But you'll notice it, it drops up and down quite a bit. And what's happening there is that we are doing dynamic compilation in the background. So we decode the x86 instructions. We then work out what bytecodes need to actually be run. We turn them into a class, load them back into Hotspot, and let Hotspot go and compile it. So you can see when you've been running for a little bit, it really ramps up and gets up to the sort of you know, the 10%, 20% type of um, real-time speed. So we say JPC peaks at about 20% at the moment, and we have a, a very good idea of how we could double that speed. But uh, as you can see, we can play games. Uh, you can go to the JPC website, uh, and you can play this online, because it sits in an applet, so it's fine to run. OK, Chris, can we go back to the slides? OK, so the hacker's challenge now is as follows. Find a bug in the JVM, which enables a security breach, first, first thing to do, hopefully very difficult. Then you find a bug in JPC, but that has to coincide with the bug in the JVM you found in step one. And then, finally, work out what code would need to be run in an x86 machine such that it hits the bug in JPC that you found, which also then coincides with the bug in the JVM that you found in order to get out of the container and exploit some sort of security hole. Um, you got, they're working against the the huge patch cycle for the JVM vendors, of course, who, for, for whom security is a real big issue, and they are constantly trying to address these issues. And the fact JPC is open source means you can go and look at JPC or build a clean version if you suspect it's been tampered with. Um, so basically, I say, well, that's, a, that's an impossible challenge. I think uh, I would be happy letting anyone load code into an environment protected by these two independent layers of security. So now we've got a solution for the security issue. Now let's look at distribution, and this is where Nereus comes in. So we want to get the most out of uh, the global billion PCs, and we can't use simple client server. There's just no way there's a server big enough in the world for that. So we look at examples of other systems that have scaled to that level and come up with the idea that basically we need a forest of trees. Click, there we are. That's what we're going to do, and that's what Nereus is. So if we go to the next slide, it's an open source, massively parallel uh, computations infrastructure in Java. It's also the Greek god of the sea, or a Greek god of the sea. And it provides two things. It provides an applet sandbox. So this is not so an applet in the, in the usual sense of a Java applet. It's a Nereus service sits inside a security sandbox that is provided by Nereus client. Coincidentally, that is very similar to the Java applet sandbox. And we get Java-only execution within a standardized environment, a sandbox environment. We get it either as a standalone client, which is the lower image on the screen there, or we get it in an ordinary browser in the Java plugin, actually embedded in an ordinary applet. And that's the upper uh, picture. And if you look carefully, you'll see there are differences in the UI, but not very many. And the environment that the programmer sees, or the environment the Nereus application developer sees, exactly the same in both cases, same security restrictions same API available. Importantly, the Nereus client provides the ability to, prov to create sandboxes within sandboxes. So once you've created one, you can then tell it to create a sandbox underneath it, and an underneath that, and underneath that. And each of these sandboxes remains uh, at the mercy of its parent. Um, so all authority delegates upwards in a chain. So you can sort of delegate authority down, and then the software sitting in the sandboxes lower down has to obey by the rules enforced by the parent sandboxes. So there's a very nice way of sort of delegating authority from the initial 
download of a sandbox, which is when the owner of the machine, the human being, actually says, yes, I'm going to give you permission to use my CPU by pointing their Nereus client to that server, uh, and then that authority delegates down to subsequent downloads of software. So we go to the next slide. System design. Uh, Nereus basically tries to uh, turn the system into a flat accessible network, but we have a few issues to deal with, mostly related to the fact that an applet stroke Java um, sandbox usual policy is to restrict the network communications to the server that you came from. So the Nereus server is the server as far as the uh, applet sandbox is concerned. That's the server you came from. And so the Nereus server provides various gateway functionalities to get network communications in and out. So we have number of servers. Again, these are all trees in this forest. They're not, they're not connected in any way. They're just there. Uh, we have the applet clients and an enterprise clients. So there's applets in the standalone program. And then hopefully lots of people put more machines on. So we, oh sorry, no, we have web servers as well. They're just the ordinary web servers out there in the world. Then we have a load of other machines that hopefully contribute to each Nereus server. Um, a machine in the group up the top left hand corner there knows about Nereus server number two, but none of those machines explicitly know about any of the other machines anywhere else. There's nothing, there's no rule that says they have to understand that. It's just basically DNS, look up a URL, and if you happen to know that, it's like what Google does for you. If you want to find something, you go to Google, it knows about it because it's been busily indexing the system. Our design here expects that there'll be an indexing system for Nereus as well. The communications go around through the Nereus servers. As I said, the Nereus server acts like a proxy to get around the security restrictions of sandboxes, um, and that goes two ways. You can go in and out um, of the Nereus servers to the clients sitting underneath them. And if we look at the next overlay, there we are. There are some client software. So the user server, which is in red, can push software down into the boxes, into the sandboxes created by the Nereus clients, either applets or applications. And, and that essentially allows them to have installations of their software out in the real world. And then once they've got them, they can communicate with them in logical terms via directly via the blue arrows, but in fact it's going through these other proxying systems. If I get rid of the plumbing, it becomes a lot more obvious and simpler. Basically, it's a flat network. All these things can communicate with anything they like, including third-party web servers, and everyone's happy. Hopefully, that works really well. So here's a demo as Animation Grid. So this is a website. We have this running currently um, over in Oxford. And the idea is here is we're going to do some rendering for you. So we take an, an arbitrary image. And before you do that, Chris, this, uh, this is a scene. There's a selection of scenes here. And there's an image that Chris has uploaded, or was about to upload. And that image will be slotted into that scene in a particular location. So if you choose the left-hand one, there's a white wall on the right-hand side. The image that Chris uploads will be slotted in there, and then we'll do the rendering of that, that image, of that, of that scene. So submit that now, Chris. Now, the, the reason why we do it this way is we want to show, you know, prove that we really did do a lot of work. So this is high quality ray traced rendering. Each frame of this uh, scene would take approximately 30 seconds on a single machine running full pelt. And we've got approximately 50 machines sitting in Oxford currently logged on doing work for us. So you see that as the system gets going, we get more and greater, and greater chunks of frames coming in. And you know, it's, it's basically split the frames up into individual jobs and sprayed them out onto the grid. And they're all doing individual ones. And of course, different machines are different speeds. So that's why you get this sort of, that's why, say, frame two hasn't come back yet, because that's a slower machine. It hasn't come back. Um, and that, they'll just eventually come in. And the great thing about this is it's a sort of read-only process. You, you do some rendering. You get the result. You chuck it back to the server. And if for whatever reason, that client goes away or doesn't finish in time, the server can resubmit that. It's just a whole list of independent jobs. So a very nice and simple um, grid application just to prove the principle. Now, this is slightly different from your conventional uh, grid or multi-user uh, system in that, whereas uh, if I had a lot of clients, I would go and download some software and then I'd be a rendering client. That's not the way this works at all. We have a lot of Nereus clients who have connected to a Nereus server, and that's, that's an empty box. What we then have is a system that goes around installing these animation software on each of these bits of uh, these empty, empty Nereus clients. And that's a completely separate process. 
And of course, you can do animation, you can do lots of different things. It's all within control. So I think we'll leave that now and go back to the presentation. We'll come back to that and it'll have finished all the bits. Another feature that we get with JPC, which is important for the, the, the it's part of the way the system, I think, should work, is hardware level checkpoints. You go to the next one? Yeah. Because we emulate everything in the hardware, um, and we can literally stop the CPU at a clock cycle if we want to, just freeze it. And we can save the entire state, including the memory, the disk state, all the registers, everything. So we could resume it later on. We can just stop and start. But equally, click the next one, we can resume on a completely different machine. Just move the state around. We could also, if we put the storage of the state somewhere else, some third place, we could then have that, that state available just anywhere. And the machine that's currently executing that virtual machine can just be anywhere in the world, crunch, 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 crunch. It becomes busy. The user needs to use their own machine. Uh, they decide to stop Nereus working on that machine. Then the computation just stops. The storage is back at the original location. We just shift, point a new Nereus client at that machine, uh, at, the, at that storage and it can, the computation continues from where it left off. So we get a very nice um, system that is just a great way of getting lots of throughput for lots of computation. So if we go to the next slide, so diagrammatically, let me explain. This is basically what I've been saying. The checkpoint store, lots of images, disk images and state. You then have a lot of Nereus servers and then a lot of Nereus clients. And then you've got these red boxes, which are the JPC instances running the emulator inside the Nereus clients. And they have got, uh, well, they've got their hard disks virtually pointed back to the checkpoint store. And each one will be running a particular hardware image at any one time. And then you have a resource sweeper that goes around the grid. Basically, it goes around trying to find Nereus clients that happen to t come up, you know, when they connect for the first time. It then sweeps around and says, oh, look, there's some more machines. I'm going to put more JPC clients on there. So it just goes and installs the software in more and more places, and it keeps going, because obviously as they'll be in a level at which you want to achieve, and as clients drop off, you want to create more. And those clients just then come alive and say, oh, I need to do some processing. I go to a broker, and then, you know, in detail through the Nereus server, but in logically, they go to the broker. The broker says, checkpoint number four, or PC number four, is currently not being worked on by anyone. Why don't you work on that? And so it connects that and says, off you go and process. And there's a sort of sense in which you incrementally checkpoint yourself as you go along. So if the process suddenly dies, you don't lose all the work. You just go back to the checkpoint you had previously and you continue on. So you don't lose masses amount each time you, you, a client goes away. So I think we're up to the final demo. So Nereus and JPC, so the, the combination of the two together. Um, this is, uh, we're going to do this locally for the, in, in the spirit of being quick and not necessarily having to rely on networks between here and Oxford. But uh, Chris is now running a storage server. So that's uh, where the disk image will reside. And then we've got to run an Arrayus server there as well. So there's an Arrayus server. It doesn't do much interesting. But now we're going to go to the browser. And this becomes slightly more interesting. So we go to Arrayus. No, you don't. You go to localhost. localhost. Yes, localhost would be better. So localhost. This is the Arrayus server running locally. Um, and he's going to contribute to the system just by clicking on a link. So we're now. This is how easy it is to become a member of the Nereus grid. You just click on a link in a browser. As long as you've got the Java plugin, it comes up with a, the applet version of the Nereus client. And we've downloaded this document. So it's an NML document. It describes things like what classes needed to be loaded and uh, what the ID, the name of the service is. It's a very simple document. But now Chris is now going to go back. There's this, the total list of clients on this Nereus server, Current, obviously only one at this point. But if anyone's here has got a network and we, the firewall didn't prevent us listening to connections, you could just go and join that. But he's now going to go to that container and tell it to load a JPC NML structure. So game's good. Let's do that one. And if you go back to the Nereus client, on the other side, we've now got a local host uh, uh, sub sandbox, if you like. And it's loaded a JPC instance. If you go click there, that's the standard output, standard error of the JPC software running, which is just diagnostics. And that's not intended to be looked at, really, by anyone but a developer. From the point of view of the user who's running the JPC, you want to see the console output of JPC, what's, what's the image. And that's served up by the, uh, 
the JPC instance itself. So we now have another applet. Now this applet is not doing JPC. That's not running the emulation. That's just looking at the graphics card and taking the key presses and sending it round the whole loop, round the Nereus server and back again and bringing the graphics updates back to here. So we can essentially do the same thing as we did before. But you see it's slightly more jerky because what's happening is we're going via a proxy server. Even though it's looped back, it's taking a little bit of time. And we're using uh, PNG compression to get the images backwards and forwards. It's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but it's what we've got so, so far. Um, the application, of course, is not to play games remotely. That, that's just for example purposes. The application is to get a load of, say, Linux images that are all set to do lots of processing for you, and you want, say, a million of these images all to do the same processing bar one input variable where, you know, one to a million different input files. Um, in that sense, all you do is you, you, you just want to make sure every now and then that they're still running. So you connect to the, the graphics output of one of these instances every so often and say, oh, yes, that's still okay, that's running, and you close down. You don't really want to look at it all the time. So that's fine for verifying that the system or that particular instance of JPC or the emulated uh, PC is in fact running uh, accurately. And all of this is um, open source and it's a fairly simple protocol so it can be done automatically scripted up. So there we go. We now, basically what I've done is achieved what should be impossible which is without the user's explicit authorization, all they had to do was click one link to go and load that original Nereus applet but by doing that, they have delegated authority, and I've come in separately, loaded a PC emulator into their little environment, and run some native DOS, in this case DOS games, but some native x86 x executable, without the need to worry about uh, security, without worrying if that was a virus or anything, because it's completely isolated. And on top of that, I then maintain control in the sense that I can now look at the graphics card and interact with that virtually running machine from anywhere in the world. And I think there, we go back to the presentation. One final slide, which uh, once we get through that, yep, is the <coughs> conclusion of these two things running concurrently and two technologies complementing each other, we get a massively parallel computation resource. Thank you very much. We have a, we have a, a couple of minutes for questions, but not, not that many, I'm afraid. So, Chris, do you want to just... Pack it up. Any questions? What's the largest installation you've uh, One, we've gone up to 700 on one Nereus server. That was nothing special in terms of a server. I mean, the, the design requirements are for an average PC should be able to manage 1,000 clients. And the way it scales up globally is you don't try and keep more and more clients in one server. You have a few more servers. You can do 1,000 at a time or 10,000 at a time, that sort of number. Yeah, yeah, we had a few thoughts about that. Um, there are various things you can do, of course, but then ultimately you can't give a cast iron guarantee, clearly, because the, the software is running on your machine. If you've got really low-level debuggers and stuff, you could get in and find it out. So the best policy I've come up with so far is to say, you know, hands off, yes, it's hard, it's not for the average person, but there is no guarantee. So if you're worried about the privacy of your data, obfuscate it before you send it out, do the processing in some obfuscated way, and then demap it on the way back. Okay, well, great, I'm oh, sorry. The last thing, uh, what kind of, uh, you, the description mentioned something about paying users. What yeah. Of, what were you looking at? Uh, the business model, we looked at various business models, and the obvious one that you know, I naively come up with is to say, well, we'll pay them for every job they do. Right. Uh, that doesn't work, especially with an open source project, because you could easily engineer it so it lied. Uh, I think, on balance, the best solution is essentially, uh, you know, uh, uh, we pay you £10 a month or $10 a month or whatever the number is, just flat rate. And unless you, your system is unavailable below some threshold, you, you get that no matter what. And we just have to work out what that level of pain is or benefit, depending on your point of view, uh, that makes that viable. But uh, on the whole, Getting the resource to run stuff is not the problem. <laughs> People are very happy to give you stuff, particularly if you, they, they're going to even earn a little bit of money. Um, it's really making sure that it's not going to compromise their other uses that's the issue, and then making it a, the whole system attractive for users when they come up against the issues of how they re-engineer their software to 
be distributed in the way that it needs to be. Is that the only way to run jobs? Um, so no, you, you can, you, Nereus is, is a separate product in the sense that you can run Java processing in Nereus without the PC bit. Um, so if you wanted to not suffer the slowdown factor of the PC emulation, you could run Java processing. The, the one thing about that, though, is to get bulletproof security. In a Java applet, you can still, if you really want to be nasty, you could use lots of threads or, and burn the CPU and, and get, get in the way of people. You could learn, use lots of memory or stuff like that. So there's no way currently in the JVM for us to limit that. Whereas with JPC, we can, because the, threads, the thread that's running is the emulator thread. It's actually under the control of the, the software. You, you, it's not being, it can't be uh, hijacked for any other purpose. It just runs the emulation. Indeed, the same as memory. When you say the PC's got this much RAM, that's how much it's got. You can't do anything about that. So there are, there are balances to how, how paranoid you are, whether you'd like to allow this Java processing or whether you, you just want to only have PC emulated processing. Yeah. Uh, do you have any way to limit CPU? I know a lot of jobs take yeah. advantage of the system when it's not yeah. at all. Yeah. Well, we, we've tried that out quite a lot. And at one point, we did have a way of uh, changing things and you know, letting the user say only this time of day and that sort of stuff. But in the end, it was way too complicated. And you put the Java threads down at low priority, and you just don't notice. You really don't. We've had it running in the department at Oxford, and people have forgotten it's running, even though technically, if you look at the CPU meter, it's 100% all the time. It, you just, it doesn't affect anything. Um, so we think that on balance, the modern scheduling software in the operating system should be able to manage that. Great. Well, thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.